The second Sabbath of every year is a Sabbath dedicated to health awareness. To awareness to bring our attention to health. And since that's not going to be possible next Sabbath, we have switched that to this Sabbath. And we're so grateful that we have Brother John, who is of course a health expert, to share with us this subject. Now the subject, the theme of this year's health awareness is our mental well-being, our mental health. That is what the subject is going to be focusing on. And you know, we often think just of our physical, but actually our mental health is really part of health also. And it is a big problem in our world today. One in five Americans have mental health issues. Can you imagine? One in five of all Americans have mental health concerns. And so since we are in America, and actually in the rest of the world, the statistics are probably similar, either a little more or a little less, I think this subject is important for us. And mental health is also a problem, not in the world only, but also where? In our churches. Even in our churches, we have uh, mental health issues. And now it's my privilege to turn the meeting over to Brother John, who will share on this subject. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Uh, I think that the, uh, the head of the GC medical department made a good decision when picking the decision of mental health. And uh, hopefully this can be a blessing to each and every one of us because mending broken brains is a very, very important thing. And there are people among us whose brains are broken. And how do we as a church, how do we as a people address this? So I think it's a wonderful, um, a wonderful topic. And hopefully, if you, if you look across the places, we have that 21M um, app. Hopefully, next week, you will find different, different topics aligned with this that you can watch from maybe the Roanoke Church, maybe the, uh, the uh, church in Sacramento, um, where we have different perspectives on mending of the broken, the broken brain. Um, as we go into this, we will proceed with one of the most miserable men alive in his time, according to himself. Abraham Lincoln was one of the most depressed people and one of the highest people in the United States. He was the president, right, in his time during the Civil War. And here is a quote from President Abraham Lincoln. You know, I was reading on him. There's various topics amazing that you can read about his state of depression where he would have a, a rousing speech. He was an incredibly tormented man, but he'd have this amazing speech, and everyone would be cheering him on, and they're ready to usher him into the presidency, and they would all leave, and who would be there in the hall all by himself? Abraham Lincoln, just sitting there, his head just, head, his long, lanky arms just kind of slouched over, and his campaign manager would be like, that was an amazing speech, and he'd be like, I am so unhappy. I'm in such a melancholy spirit. So here you see Abraham Lincoln, he says now that I am the most miserable man living if what I feel were equally distributed to the whole human family, there would not be one cheerful face on the earth. Can you imagine that? Not one cheerful face. That's how horrible he felt. He goes on to say, whether I shall ever be better, I cannot tell. I awfully forebode I shall not. To remain as I am is impossible. I must die or be better, it appears to me. Sometimes when you look at statements like this, his incredible depression, this man multiple times felt that it was time for him to die. He was that depressed. And you, you can't blame him. The weight on his shoulders, the amazing amount of killing in his country. You can think of maybe, you know, our, our Ukrainians were having trouble communicating, but do you think Zelensky is in a happy feeling right now? And part of being a president. Part of being a president. In a wartime, war-torn thing, plus mental illness on top of that, he underwent incredible stress, incredible depression. Um, depression today is the most common mental disorder in the United States, in the world. Over 350 million people of all ages suffer from depression globally. That's a lot. 
17% of the people in the U.S. are depressed. The annual rate of depression is 10%. And if you have a chronic illness, diabetes, heart disease, something debilitating, that's a quarter of people. A quarter of those people are depressed. And another interesting statistic, if you are depressed and you have another chronic illness, your rates of recovery are lower. So if you've had a heart attack and you're depressed, you're more likely to die in the next two years. If you've had a stroke and you're depressed, you're more likely to have bad outcomes. So depression and, and general medical illness go hand in hand. One can spurn the other, and then the other will feed back negatively into the first. And in the end, it's all a spiral to the bottom, okay? The lifetime rate is almost a quarter. So of everyone here, according to the statistics, in our life, a quarter of us will become depressed at some point. And once you get the depression, um, it comes back. You may get over it, but it, it re you relapse. You relapse. A couple other interesting statistics here. Uh, depression, it causes, in terms of the cost to society, 30, between 30 and 50 billion P, uh, dollars, 30 to 50 billion dollars a year annually are lost because of depressed workers, the complications associated with depression, the lack of productivity. So there's a huge cost on our economy and on our churches, our families. So these are some of the statistics we can look at with depression. And Mind, Character, and Personality, here is a quote from Ellen White. Mind, Character, and Personality, page 59, so early on, uh, volume one. She says that nine-tenths of the diseases we experience, they originate in the mind. Sickness of the mind prevails everywhere. Nine-tenths of the disease which men suffer have their foundation here. Perhaps some, living home, uh, perhaps some living home trouble is like a canker eating at the very soul and weakening the life forces. So do we have this in our lives, this canker, this cancer, originating from the mind, ruining the body, or the body infecting the mind, and in the end it's, it's a spiral. It's a self-feeding, self-fulfilling prophecy towards more and more negativity. What is depression? Uh, I was thinking, but with the language barriers, I didn't do it today. I was thinking to put out a, depre a, a depression questionnaire. And here you have it here. This is the official diagnosis of depression. You need just five of these symptoms to be present for greater than two weeks, and you're diagnosed with depression. And what's very interesting is depression is going, uh, it's, it's everywhere. It's prevalent in society. The rates are probably lower than we realize. Because your primary care doctor, when he or she receives patients, they're not always checking this. So many people are depressed. So a lot of people fall through the holes. And depression isn't diagnosed or it isn't treated because it isn't looked for. So do you have a depressed mood for greater than two weeks? Have you lost interest in things that used to excite you, used to give you pleasure? Maybe you've lost interest in hobbies, reading if you liked it, or certain activities. Do you either sleep too much or have trouble sleeping? Do you, have you had a change in appetite or your weight recently? Have you had psychomotor retardation? That is where everything slows down. You don't think fast. You don't work fast. You just slovenly go along your way. Or are you psychomotor agitation? That's where you're talking, you're stressed, you're running around. Those are all signs of depression. Low energy, poor concentration, feelings of worthlessness or guilt, thoughts of death or suicide. So what does me have to do with any of this? Because I'm not a professional in depression. But I do see depression in a very unique time. And um, I see the extremes of depression. I see the extremes results. I'll see the extreme results of depression and the extreme treatments of depression. And this is the most extreme treatment of depression. Does anyone know what this is right here? This is electroconvulsive therapy, ECT. And my job would be the guy with the blue shirt in the back. I would provide sedation for this most extreme form of treatment for depression. These are patients that have psychotic diseases, or major depressive episodes that are so resistant, medication doesn't help, 
nothing helps. Eventually, they end up in the hospital, institutionalized. They can't go out into normal life because they're a hazard or a danger to themselves. And when none of the medications and nothing is working, we do electroconvulsive therapy. And you see these probes here held on either side of the brain. The psychiatrist puts them on the patient's head and plain just electrocutes them. You electrocute the patient. Of course, I induce the anesthesia so they're asleep and unconscious. That electrical current either comes from here to here or here to here based off of or here to here. There's different forms they use based off of the resistance of the depression. And that forms a seizure. That forms a seizure. And that seizure, that goes all the way to the point of the patient shaking. And you let the seizure pass. And what you have is a full release. You have a full release of things like serotonin, norepinephrine, other things like that. And once that is all released, those chemicals have a lasting change, a lasting change. And that lasting change is there for a long, long time. And sometimes you need to do this two times a week, three times a week, multiple times a week. And then with multiple treatments, I have one patient in the past I took care of, she was in her 80s. She's had this for 20, 30, 40 years, you know? So that's, that's a normal thing. And um, so I see the extremes here on this side, and I also see the extremes on the other side of, of uh, depression. And this is suicide, okay? This is the result of depression that hasn't been treated. I've had patients take all kinds of medications, and then they decide they want to live. And they come in, and they want to live, and the medications are starting to take effect, and they're not going to live. If only they had, at some point, paused. If only they had addressed these symptoms sooner. But now it's too late. So ECT, the last resort therapy, and here their last resort medical intervention all because of depression. So these are extremes, but even in our church, brothers and sisters, do you know there can be suicide? I thought of, I can think of now names in my head, a name in North America, someone very close to our church who's committed suicide. So I think many times in our life, especially in our church, thoughts of this, oh, it can't happen. It's not part of us. But I want us to be open to this idea that, yes, we too, as reformers, can have broken minds. And I cannot talk about this without bringing up the suicide crisis hotline. Because a lot of those patients, had they called this number, maybe they would have had a chance. Had they called a loved one, maybe they would have had a chance, rather than making an impulse action. If, if we go back here real quick, I want to bring up the suicide circumstances. These people have had, 50% of them have had a health problem in the past, a mental health problem. Look here, 31%, the crisis developed in the last two weeks. So they were maybe depressed and then something in the last two weeks, things like intimate partner problem, a physical health thing, or maybe substance abuses, or alcohol, drugs, things that maybe if they would have just had somebody intervene at the right time, they wouldn't they wouldn't have gotten to this point. 988 is the number you would call if you're having a medical, it's like 911, 988 for a psychiatric emergency. So depression and mental illness, is it present in the reform? I think we would be ignorant and we would not be serving our members well if we said it wasn't. And I think every one of us here has some form of mental illness. Um, many times, I, growing up in the church, have noticed this view, and I believe it's an incorrect view, that if we follow all the eight laws of health, if we uh, are vegetarians, if we read the Bible and we read the spirit of prophecy, we can get to the point where we don't have a broken mind in a broken world. And maybe some people are blessed by God to have sound minds, but there is still the possibility that good Christians deal with depression. Good Christians deal with depression. And if we ignore this in our churches, if we ignore this in our church members, then I think we'll have sad results. 
And rather than making depression more of a taboo thing in our church, we should make it more of a thing that is understood and resources are provided in order to help people. So I brought up Psalms 88, 18. It's the most depressed psalm. Have you read Psalm 88? Just read Psalm 88 at home today. It is the most depressed psalm in the Bible. And it ends with, everything is gone, and the closest friend of the psalmist is who? It was one of the sons of Korah who wrote this. Darkness is their closest friend. We'll talk more about Psalm 88 later. But before we go on, I want to bring up biblical depression. Because if we don't believe that depression is real in our church, and we don't seek to understand and locate people who are maybe depressed among us, or even admit that I myself am depressed, we're being ignorant of biblical individuals who were clinically depressed. And we'll go through them today. So if you're depressed, you are not alone. Depression in the Bible, David. You read the Psalms, there's depression everywhere in the Psalms. Many songs of anguish, many psalms of guilt. In Psalms 38, he says, My guilt has overwhelmed me like a burden too heavy to bear. And we can all think of those psalms where he mourned, he prayed, he was depressed. Yet he was a man of God. If you look at Elijah, does everyone remember Elijah? Someone who could do such great things, kind of like Abraham Lincoln. Great, amazing things, and then when another minute he is in the depths of despair. It says in uh, 1 Kings 19, he came to a uh, broom bush and sat down under it and prayed that he might die. You know when this happens? This is when he runs to Mount Horeb after fleeing from Jezebel. At the peak, just a day or two before, he had taken out all the prophets of Baal. And, and here he is at Mount Horeb. He lays under a bush by the entrance of a cave and he says, take my life, Lord. I am no better than my ancestors. A depressed, a depressed man, yet a man of God. Yet a man of God, a prophet. Jonah, we've talked about him at length. Many times in Jonah, he says, Lord, just take my life. It's not worth living. He was an angry man and a depressed, a depressed man. Job, was Job a happy-go-lucky guy? He lost his family. He lost all his wealth. He says in Job 3.11, Why do I not, did I not perish at birth and die as I came from the womb? He got to the point of he wished he would never have been born. Jeremiah. We don't read Jeremiah too often. But he said a similar thing in Jeremiah 20.18. Why did I ever come out of the womb to see the trouble and sorrow and to, my end of days in sh and, and to end my days in shame? Now, I want to point out the, the, the chief person who suffered from states of depression, and that's Christ. What does Isaiah 53 foretell of him? He would be a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Mark 14, 34. What does Christ say here? This is when he's in Gethsemane. He says, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. He said to them, stay here and keep watch. Going a little farther, he fell on the ground and prayed, if possible, that the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Do you think that Christ, when he was carrying the sins of the world, do you think that he was in this state of bliss? This perfect bliss? I think he was, you know, Abraham Lincoln said he was the most depressed man alive, but I think the truth of in all of history, the most depression experienced ever would be on the shoulders of Christ when he was carrying the sins of the whole world. So if Christ has been there, if Christ has had the experience of depression, I think we can find a great amount of, of support in understanding that, you know what, he understands where we are today, right? Right? He carried our depression on his shoulders. He carried our sins on his shoulders. The sins and the depression of the whole world, from the past to the present and the future, were all on his shoulders. And you can imagine him at Gethsemane there. And many people in depression are so depressed they cannot get up off the ground. They're just there. That's, that's what Christ was in depression. And what did he do in that time? 
not my will, but thy will. So the blessing for us is in Psalms 34, 18. The Lord is near the brokenhearted, and he saves the crushed spirit. So you can say, well, Christ was carrying the sins of the world. He was depressed. But you know what? We're Christians now. We're free in Christ. We shouldn't experience depression as long as we have a balanced mind and we follow all the eight laws of health. A true reformer should always be in perfect neurologic mental health. Is that something that is realistic in this day and age? I want to show you another person who struggled with depression. Ellen White. And if you read Ellen White, her biography, she had immense depression at multiple times in her life. And I'll read you a few of her quotes. Because a lot of times we read mind, character, and personality, and we read the mind over matter, and we can decide to be happy. And if you only read that, you have a very different view. You feel like, you know what, to be a good Christian who will be saved, I need to always be happy 100% of the time. That's not the case even with Ellen White, the one who wrote these words. In her autobiographical account, Ellen White frequently describes many times of depression and melancholy. Many were merely a passing sadness over present conditions, but others were extended periods of gloom and discouragement. She often attributed her depressed spirits to physical ill health, which she suffered throughout her life, in part a result of the life-threatening accident she experienced when she was nine years old. Does anyone remember that when the girl threw the rock? It hit her between the eyes. She was very ill for many years, almost dying and very, very depressed. If you read her writings, she was even wondering if she was in any way going to be saved. So it was not just a, a depression, but she was questioning, you know what, am I even right with God? Going on with Ellen White, she recognized, and this was from an Adventist Review article on the depression of our Ellen White, she recognized that there are a variety of causes for depression. Beyond physical illness, including diet, genetics, guilt, inactivity, and the weather. And this is very interesting because today, and I didn't go into the pathophysiology of depression, but today there are many causes of depression. There's, there's events, you may lose a loved one. There are things like um, losing of a job. Those things, external, but then there's internal things like serotonin, GABA, norepinephrine, and that's where a lot of the drugs treat those different pathways. But there is no one, one thing, one magic bullet to depression. It's a very complex illness. And Ellen White recognizes back in her time. It says here, she knew the darkness of losing children and even one's life companion to death. Recalling the bereavement of her three-year-old son, John Herbert, she wrote, after returning from the funeral, my home seemed lonely. I felt reconciled to the will of God, yet despondency and gloom settled upon me. Can you imagine? Can you imagine the sadness of that time? Uh, another statement from that article. 1859, Ellen White candidly informed church members, for years I have been afflicted with dropsy or edema and disease of the heart which has had a tendency to depress my spirits and destroy my faith and courage. She described having felt no desire to live and being unable to muster enough faith to even pray for my recovery. Can you imagine that? So depressed, the woman who speaks with God, who has the Spirit of God coming upon her, she is so depressed she can hardly even pray for her recovery. I don't know that many of us have felt that kind of depression here today. During this time, she confided in her diary, Oh, why is it that such gloom rests upon everything? Why can I not rise above the depression of spirit? I have no health, and my mind is completely depressed. Of Elijah, she wrote, If under trying circumstances, men of spiritual power, pressed beyond measure, become discouraged and desponding, if at times they see nothing desirable in life, that they, should be, that they should choose it, this is nothing strange or new. You know what's interesting here? The prophet of the Lord is speaking about prophets, similar to herself, who are depressed. She continues, those who standing in the forefront of the conflict, like herself, like Elijah, 
are impelled by the Holy Spirit to do a special work, will frequently feel the reaction when the pressure is removed. Very interesting here. She speaks that after times when the Holy Spirit impelled her or compelled her to do something like Elijah, the Holy Spirit enabled him to do something. When it was removed, she felt a deep, he felt a deep depression. In fact, in this article I read, it even talked of when the church was doing poorly, when admonition was given to her for members in the church, that was taken to heart of her and James. And they were so depressed at the feeble or poor status of the church, it affected them. So here the prophet of the Lord, she was depressed from the enfeebled part of the church, depressed when she had to give bad news, depressed when the Spirit of God would leave her. She continues on to say here, if I can find where I was, despondency may shake the most heroic faith and weaken the most steadfast will. But God understands and he still pities and loves. I have indeed been halting under the shadow of the cross. It is not a common thing for me to be overpowered and to suffer so much depression of spirit as I have suffered for the last few months. I would not be found to trifle with my own soul and thus trifle with my Savior. I must trust in him irrespective of the changes of my emotional atmosphere. I must show forth the praises of him who called me out of darkness into his marvelous light. My heart must be steadfast in Christ, my Savior, beholding his love and gracious goodness. I must not trust him now and then, but always, that I may manifest the results of abiding in him who has bought me with his precious blood. We must learn to believe the promise to have an abiding faith so that we may take them as the sure word of God. This was found, Mind, Character, Personality, page 811. It's Appendix B. If you want to read that, that is specifically her talking about her moments of depression. So Mind, Character, Personality, volume 2, it's at the very end, Appendix B. I think that we see Ellen White, we see the the servants of the Lord throughout all Bible history, we see Christ himself, at times they all suffered with depression. It is a normal thing for human beings in a broken world to deal with these things. Some to varying levels. I believe that Christ, when he, or the Holy Spirit, when, they, when it picks a person to be a servant of the Lord, it takes all of this into account. Is this person, like Ellen White, able not only to give give the, the admonitions of the Spirit, but are they able to tolerate it when the Spirit is gone, when the sadness comes, when the sorrow comes? It is normal for us as people of God to sometimes experience things that, that you wouldn't expect a happy Christian to go through. So I, I seek to ask every one of us today that we do two things, that we recognize either depression in ourselves or we recognize depression in a loved one. And then two, if we recognize it in ourselves or that loved one, we seek help with it. So we seek help for them. How can we seek help? I believe A, our pastors need to be better aware on how to deal with this. You know, we're very good with the theology and we're good with the, you know, all the stuff, all the stuff. Is it important? Yes. But with mental health, I think a pastor should, and a minister should have some awareness. They don't have to be a professional, but they should have some awareness on how to deal with this in our churches. But then also have contacts, either faith-based counselors, psychologists, psychiatrists, that they can refer a church member to. Because instead of something that's being taboo and hidden, it is something that needs to be addressed before it becomes worse. Uh, secondly, so... If you see it in someone you love or yourself, we ourselves need to seek for help. And I think the best way to go is go the biblical counseling route first of all. And if it's really, really bad, psychiatric help or medical help. On top of that, and I think this is very good, uh, every reformer should have this or every Adventist, we need to have a holistic approach. So this is Depression, the Way Out by a, a Adventist physician, Neil Nedley. 
I think this is important to have. I think Mind, Character, and Personality, written by Ellen White. Both of those volumes are good. Healthful Living. That gives us a holistic approach to how we can deal with depression. Okay? And if we look at dealing with a depression and addressing depression, I'm not going to go into the science of all this. This could be a seminar. But if we have a healthy lifestyle and eat healthy food, we're going to have better moods. Does that mean is our diet well balanced? Do we have the amino acids to make serotonin, like tryptophan? If we don't have a balanced diet, we're not making the basic chemical that keeps us happy. Are we taking our omega-3s or plant-based linoleic acids? Are we as vegetarians and vegans making sure that we get proper vitamin B12, proper folic acid, which are known to help uh, in depression? In fact, when I was, if you read this Depression the Way Out, folic acid, people who are def deficient in folic acid, they can be on all these medications and the depression is highly resistant to the medications until they start taking the folic acid. And once they replace that, suddenly it's a little bit more treatable. Exercise. See, we can seek help, right? And maybe we need medications or psychiatric intervention. And for sure we need biblical counseling, but we gotta hit everything else to be holistic. And as a reformer, we should understand that. Proper diet, but also exercise, and it doesn't need to be much. It can be working out at least 30 minutes, a jog or a walk three times a week, sunlight, making sure you regulate your sleep, classical music therapy, and then is our religion, here at the bottom, daily spiritual exercises, is our religion any benefit to us? Because if it's not, I don't know why we bother. If we just go to church to get more depressed, then there's no point there. And if we don't go and have spiritual connection with Christ every day, then there's no point to the religious aspect, the spiritual aspect, which is proven to help people in depression. Addressing depression, we need to correct our thinking. So here's where Ellen White talks a lot about this. And I think she was actually underlying, she was discovering through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, cognitive behavioral therapy, which we talk of today. And it's a non-medication method. It, is, it aims to identify and correct the erroneous interpretations of events, change negative automatic thoughts, and initiate and perpetuate that initiate and perpetuate the negative mood. So, so many times we let our mind go and wander and we're wandering into who knows where. We're thinking negative things. We are not controlling what we're thinking. And if you look here from um, Mind, Character, Personality, page 7, here's Ellen White kind of underlying the principles of cognitive behavioral therapy. Through the lack of self-determination, to take themselves in hand and reform, persons can become stereotyped in a wrong course of action. How does that develop? A lack of determination. You're just floating. You're just floating. Your stream of consciousness is floating. You fail to cultivate their powers that they may acquire an ability to do the very best. Then they will find themselves in demand anywhere and everywhere. They will be appreciated for all they are worth. Here's another one. Disease is sometimes pr produced and often greatly aggravated by the imagination. Many are lifelong Invalids, who might well, uh, who might be well if they only thought so. Many imagine that every slight exposure will cause illness, and the evil effect is produced because it is expected. This is changing, changing the way you think. Many die from disease, the cause of which is wholly imaginary. This should be main plain, the power of the will and the importance of self-control, both in the preservation and in the recovery of health. The depressing and even ruinous effect of anger, discontent, selfishness, or impurity. And on the other hand, the marvelous life-giving power to be found in cheerfulness, unselfishness, and gratitude. So the way we think, the way we allow ourselves to think, that affects what we become. And Ellen White talks a lot about this in Mind, Character, and Personality. So, and you ought to imagine, even everything that she says, 
she herself struggled with. She herself struggled with because we read about the depression. She even had, hardly had the energy to pray to God to ask for help. But if you look at Ellen White in the context of everything that she writes, you realize that she was on to something here and that she was well above and ahead of her time. Finally, in addressing, um, in addressing depression, there is a place for traditional medicine. So, like I said, all the way down to electroconvulsive therapy, you have people who are in danger of committing suicide, I think us, as reformers, what we need to do is address it early on, Amen. have a holistic approach, but not to discourage people who might need, at times, medical intervention. We cannot judge those who need medical intervention. They are not a lesser Christian. So we look here at Psalms 88, 18. Remember I said, one of the darkest Psalms in the Bible. In fact, open your Bibles with me. Open your Bibles to Psalms 88, and what will you see there? What happens? You, go, you read through the psalmist, utter depression the whole way through, but what is the next psalm in the Bible? Does anyone know? Read the first verse for me. Read Psalm 89. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. My mouth will I make known thy faithfulness to all generations. Thank you, Brother John. So you look at one of the most depressing psalms. How was it organized? Right next to one of the praise psalms, one of the, the, the blessing psalms. So even in how Christ, when you have all of these things, the depression of David in the Bible, you, also, you have not only in the Bible the lows, but you also have the highs. God in the depression, when darkness is my closest friend, is still the same God that you experience in Psalm 89, singing of the mercies of the Lord. So I think it's beautiful that even though you have one of the most depressing psalms, those who organize the psalms, I don't know who put them together, but it, it was inspired in how it was organized. You have a depressing psalm followed immediately by a song of praise for how Christ has delivered the psalmist from the darkness. I would like to close with uh, 2 Corinthians 4, 8, and 9, because as we're living here in the end times, we know that these are not happy times. These can, in fact, be very depressing times. And it says here in 2 Corinthians 4, verses 8 and 9, it says that we are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary and what is unseen is eternal. This is my wish and prayer for us all. Amen.